two key components. The first one being our very own sun, which we have an image here of taken by NASA, uh, an image courtesy of the Solar Dynamics Observatory with a big, beautiful, bright sun with uh, a lot of texture on the surface there. Now, the sun is a huge ball of burning gas in our skies, or to be more precise, plasma, electrically charged, superheated gas. And the sun is, of course, the source of all the heat and light that we need here on the Earth to survive. Sitting at an average distance of 150 million kilometers away from us, the sun is about 1.4 million kilometers in diameter. It is an absolute behemoth capable of fitting over 1 million Earths inside of it. Now, the second key component of an eclipse is, of course, the moon, our very own natural satellite in orbit around the Earth. The moon is about one quarter the size of the Earth and orbits around the Earth once every 27.3 days. Now, sometimes during that orbit, the moon is closer to us and sometimes it is further away. That's because the moon's orbit is not perfectly circular. It is instead elliptical, which means sometimes it is closer and sometimes it is further away. But on average, the moon sits at a distance from us of about 384,000 kilometers. So relatively close, uh, celestially speaking. So how does that actually end up causing an eclipse? Well, we've got an animation here that can help to visualize this a little bit better for us. So as the moon orbits around the Earth, sometimes it will come directly between the Earth and the Sun. And when that positioning is just correct, just about right, we get solar eclipses. As the moon appears to cover the face of the Sun, sometimes in its entirety in the case of a total solar eclipse, and sometimes only partially in the case of today, the partial solar eclipse. Either way, the moon will cast a shadow onto the surface of the Earth. During a total solar eclipse, the darkest part of its shadow, the umbra, will pass over the Earth. And if you are within the path of totality and you sit under the shadow, you'll be able to witness the eclipse. Slightly wider and slightly lighter of a shadow of the moon is known as the penumbra. That's what we're going to see traveling across the Earth today. And all of us who are lucky enough to be under it will witness the eclipse to some degree. Now, the other type of eclipse you can get, as well as total and partial, is an annular eclipse. So that is when the moon is further away in its orbit from the Earth. So you end up getting that ring of fire. But today, it's going to be a partial solar eclipse globally, because the darkest part of the moon's shadow, its umbra, is going to miss the Earth entirely. It's going to fly over the North Pole. So no one on the globe today is going to see a total solar eclipse. But the, na uh, the question naturally arises, if the moon is orbiting around the Earth pretty much once every month, then why don't we see total solar eclipses or eclipses of any kind every single month? Well, the reason for that is because the moon's orbit is tilted at an angle of approximately five degrees, as you can see here in this rather simple graphic where nothing is to scale here, but it gives you a bit of a better idea. As you can see, the moon's uh, orbit, it's not always aligned with the plane of the Earth's orbit around the sun, that invisible line known as the ecliptic. So we're not always going to get a perfect crossover, a perfect blockage of the sun's light. Though around twice a year, we do get that line up perfectly. So we usually get a minimum of two solar eclipses every year, though sometimes we can get as many as five in one calendar year. Now, the, well, the last time that happened was all the way back in the 1930s, and that won't happen again until the 2200s. So it's a bit of a long wait to get five eclipses in one year. But now, uh, no matter where you're watching from today, we're going to bring you the best view of the eclipse that we can. But let's have a look to see if today you will be able to view the eclipse for yourself. Let's take a look at the map of the world that will show us the coverage for today courtesy of our friends over at timeanddate.com. Now, you can see the shaded areas here. If you fall underneath one of these areas, you will be able to see the eclipse to some degree. So as you can see, it's mostly large areas of Europe, as well as Central and South Asia. But as well as that, even Greenland, Iceland, and parts of Northeast Africa will get a chance to see some of the eclipse today. And within the shadows, you can see 
really the further east you go, the better your chances are of seeing more coverage. So one of the best places to view the eclipse from today, in fact, is further east. Uh, Kazakhstan is one of the best countries to view the eclipse from today. And in fact, we've got a little bit of a forecast here of just a few major capital cities uh, across the globe, just particularly choosing ones with varied amounts of coverage today. So Astana in Kazakhstan is one of the best capital cities to view the eclipse from today and surrounding regions. You're looking at about 78% coverage of the moon across the sun. So you're going to end up at maximum with a very thin crescent sun. It's going to be quite spectacular. Now, that is about just above the threshold above which you will notice the sky getting darker. So in parts of Kazakhstan and the parts of Russia, directly north of Kazakhstan, you are going to notice the sky getting noticeably darker and things getting noticeably colder. As we move further west into Europe, Helsinki and surrounding areas of Finland, looking at about 54% coverage, so that's rather good. You're going to see a slightly thicker crescent sun, but it's still going to be rather spectacular. Moving further west and slightly south, Berlin, surrounding areas of Germany as well, looking at about one-third coverage of the moon across the sun, so a rather significant bite taken out of the sun this morning. And then further west still, Paris and the surrounding areas of France, between 10 and 15% coverage. So that's across the globe, and yes, the further east you go across Europe and into Asia, you're typically going to get a better view. But what about the UK? What are our prospects for today? Well, let's take a look at the forecast. Again, looking at capital cities, London, uh, here in Greenwich as well, and just the surrounding areas. We're looking at about 16% coverage, so we're looking at a sizable chunk taken out of the sun this morning, though certainly not enough for it to get noticeably darker or really that cold either. Moving further west, we can see Cardiff, surrounding areas of Wales, about 12% coverage, and moving up north to Edinburgh, about 19%, and then as we move over to the west, over to Belfast and parts of Northern Ireland, you're looking at about 15%. Now, do not uh, worry if you're in one of those areas where the percentage is a little bit less because the truth is the difference between 12% and 19%, it's really not going to be that noticeable unless you are using very sensitive uh, solar viewing equipment. So it's really not worth getting in the car and traveling east for a few extra percent. You're really not going to notice that much of a difference. Now, I believe we are now at first contact of the sun or of the moon crossing over the sun. So let's take a look at our view through the Annie Maunder Astrographic Telescope to see what we can see. And yes, there we are. We have seen the moon as it is now beginning the partial solar eclipse. We're looking at, uh, well, we're looking at our very own natural satellite as it passes across the face of the sun. Rather spectacular. One of the things you can begin to notice, actually, is you can actually see uh, different lunar terrain. You can see the rugged lunar topography in action because the moon itself it is not this smooth marble like object it is rugged there are hills there are valleys and that is what we're beginning to see already we are seeing hills and valleys already so an exciting view already to kick things off but we're going to be bringing you that view of the eclipse throughout the uh, our coverage today now we are viewing the eclipse today through our Annie Maunder astrographic telescope but what is the Annie Maunder Astrographic Telescope? How does it work? And how are we bringing you the view of the solar eclipse today? Well, to tell you more, here is Royal Observatory astronomer Anna Gammon-Ross. Hello, everyone. My name is Anna. I'm one of the astronomers who works here at the Royal Observatory in Greenwich. I'm here in the Altazimuth Pavilion today to show you the equipment we're going to be using to view the partial solar eclipse. And that is our Annie Maunder Astrographic Telescope. The telescope is named after an Irish astronomer, Annie Maunder, who worked here at the observatory in the late 19th century. Our Annie Maunder Astrographic Telescope is made up of four modern telescopes all stuck together. And in particular, we're going to be using just one of those today, the Lunt Solar Telescope. The Lunt Solar Scope has a four inch aperture 
which is the diameter of the objective lens at the end of the telescope. This may seem small, but the sun is close enough and bright enough that this should do the job. The LED telescope is specifically designed for solar observing. So this means if we point it directly at the sun, it won't do any damage to the telescope. One thing that we cannot stress enough is that you should never point a normal telescope or binoculars directly at the sun. You should always use specialist solar observing equipment. And even then, you do need to be careful. Our telescope comes equipped with two key filters to help us observe the sun. The first is a blocking filter to reduce the amount of light that we see from the sun. The second is a hydrogen alpha filter so it helps us to see just a narrow bandwidth of visible light. This helps us to see certain features on the sun's surface, such as sunspots and solar prominences, which are huge loops of glowing plasma that extend out beyond the sun's surface. In order for us to show you the eclipse, we have a camera inserted into the viewing end of the telescope instead of a conventional eyepiece. This camera is connected to our computers that are then broadcasting our view so you can see the eclipse. So whether you are joining us from here in the UK, overseas or even out of space, stick with us to see the best of the partial solar eclipse from here at the Royal Observatory Greenwich. Anna Gammon Ross there showing us the Annie Maunder Astrographic Telescope which is actually just above my head, just out of shot. And we're going to be viewing the eclipse today using that, bringing you the best view that we possibly can. Now, if you are just tuning in, welcome. You are watching the Royal Observatory Greenwich's coverage of today's partial solar eclipse. My name is Jake Foster, and I will be your host for this morning, as together we witness the partial solar eclipse and the weather here in Greenwich today. So far, is pretty good. The forecast is a little bit mixed, but we'll bring you the best view that we can. Now, let's take another view through the Annie Maunder Astrographic Telescope, as we can see the moon now, the eclipse fully in action as it moves across the face of the sun. Now the moon is moving about one kilometer every second, so it is absolutely zooming through space right now. Even though it looks like a slow crawl, it really is zooming its way across space. And now while we are viewing this, we do have a few questions from viewers that have come in. So we'll answer a few of these. The first question, that's come in is, will it get noticeably darker in the UK? Uh, the short answer is no, because only about 16% of the sun's light will be uh, blocked out. That is not sufficient enough for us to really notice it, it getting darker at all here. So that's not really going to happen here. You're gonna need at least 70% coverage usually before you notice the difference. Uh, another question here, when will the next total solar eclipse be in the UK? Ah, this one will be a little bit of a wait. It won't be until 2090 that we see another total solar eclipse here in the UK. So a little bit of a wait. Though that being said, there will be a fantastic partial solar eclipse in 2026. And for that here in the UK, we're going to see about 90% coverage. So that's going to be really rather good. It will get noticeably darker for that one. Now, if you would like to view the eclipse for yourself today, there are a few ways that you can do it. But the first word of warning is that you should not look directly at the sun with the naked eye. You will need specialist solar viewing equipment to do it. Now, there are a few different ways that you can view the eclipse today, either directly or indirectly. So for example, uh, well, this is the view for a pair of solar eclipse glasses. And in fact, if you do have a pair of these, this is the ideal way to view the eclipse. Now, if you do have a pair of these, they might look a little bit like this, or you may have a solar viewer that looks like this. They work in the exact same way. You may have these stored away in a drawer from a previous solar eclipse. Now, these work because they have a black polymer filter in them. Now that filter is basically a flexible resin that uh, is infused with carbon particles. And all of that together blocks out 99.999% of the visible light coming from the sun, as well as 100% of the ultraviolet light and 100% of the infrared light as well. 
And that means that when you're wearing these, it is safe to look up at the sun. And in fact, when you put them on, as you just saw from that image there, when you put them on, you notice you actually can't see anything at all. Right now, I can't see a thing. The only thing I would be able to see was the sun, because that is the only thing that's going to be bright enough to penetrate through these filters. So if you've got a pair of those, before you use them, there are a couple of checks you need to make to make sure that they are working and that they are suitable to use. The first thing you need to check is that they are ISO certified. So you're going to look for a little logo, a little ISO logo. That's the International Organization for Standardization, who just make sure that these things are up to the correct safety standards. And as well as that, a CE certification also is a very good sign. So once you know you've got a certified piece of kit, the next thing you're going to need to do is actually check the filters themselves. You're going to want to look for things like tears, punctures, or even very large creases, which may have affected the integrity of the filter, which means they might not be safe to use anymore. But if they are all OK and none of those punctures or tears or large creases, then they are safe to use. Make sure you put them on before you look up at the sun, and then look up, look down, before you take them off again. And you should limit continuous use to about three minutes at a time, because even then, staring at the sun through these for too long is not a great idea. So about three minutes at a time, maximum. But let's say maybe you don't have any of this lying around the house, and you don't have a solar telescope, and you don't have a pair of solar binoculars either. Well, there are a few choices for you that you can still use to view the eclipse, just indirectly. So one thing you can do is build your very own solar projector. And in fact, I am going to have my Blue Peter moment here. I'm going to show you how you can do this. To build your own solar projector to project the eclipse, all you need actually is two pieces of paper, preferably card because it's a little bit more rigid, but two pieces of paper will work absolutely fine. What we're effectively going to do is recreate the conditions of a cinema here, just without all the popcorn and the sticky drinks. So this sheet of paper is going to act basically as your cinema screen, and this one is going to be your projector. To make your projector, all you need to do is put a small hole in the center of the piece of paper, like so. Now, this hole doesn't need to be more than a few millimeters in size, but try to make it as circular as you possibly can. So once you've got that, all you need to do is head outside, turn your back to the sun so that you're not facing it, hold up your projector and project the eclipse onto your screen. And you should be able to see the image of the eclipse as it happens, so you will see the bite taken out of the sun. You're going to want to hold these approximately 30 centimeters apart from one another. If you want a larger image, simply separate the screen from the projector. If you want a smaller, more focused image, just lower the distance. But let's say you don't even have two pieces of paper to rub together. Well, one thing you may have lying around the house is a piece of kitchenware uh, that I will show you right now. It's this, a colander or a spaghetti strainer, pasta strainer, whatever you call it. This actually is a pinhole projector in its very own right. Basically, it acts in the exact same way. Turn your back to the sun, hold it up high so you can project the image of the eclipse down onto the ground or onto a screen, a piece of paper. The only difference is going to be that you're going to get a few dozen projections rather than just the one. But let's say you don't even have a colander, and you don't have two pieces of paper either. You've got nothing. Uh, you've got no equipment lying around that you can use. Hopefully you have something. But one thing you can use is your very own hands. As this image shows, one thing you can use to project the eclipse is just your hands. Just cross over your fingers. And if you do it just right, you can project the eclipse onto the ground or onto a piece of paper. Or even then, let's say you don't even want to do that. Sometimes the trees make very good pinhole projectors. Effectively, the tiny little gaps between the leaves in the trees can act as pinhole projectors and they will project the image of the eclipse onto the ground. But remember, when it comes to these pinhole projectors or pinhole cameras, camera obscura, whatever you want to call it, you need to remember that you do not look up towards the sun through the projector. You look away from the sun, down towards your screen, or down towards the ground. It is not safe to look up at the sun 
again, unless you've got special solar eclipse glasses or solar viewers. Now, one person who loved eclipses and actually used them for research purposes over 100 years ago was Annie Maunder. But who was Annie Maunder? We've been mentioning her name a few times so far. Who was she and what did she do? Well, to answer those questions and more, I sat down with the senior curator of the Royal Observatory Greenwich, Louise Devoy. We'll have heard the name Annie Maunder quite a bit so far, but who exactly was Annie Maunder and what role did she play here at the observatory? Well, to help me answer those questions and more, I am delighted to be joined by the senior curator of the Royal Observatory Greenwich, Dr. Louise Devoy. Louise, thank you for joining me. Thanks, Jake. So let's begin with that question. Who exactly was Annie Maunder and what role did she play here? Sure, so Annie Maunder, or Annie Scott Dill Russell, as she was originally known, was from Northern Ireland. And she was one of five women recruited here at the Royal Observatory to help with a major new photographic project in the 1890s. The idea was that the observatory was part of a network of around 20 observatories or so, each one allocated a certain part of the sky that could be compiled together into a photographic atlas. Now, as you can imagine, it was a very ambitious project that required a lot of work, a lot of support. And so the astronomer royal William Christie, along with many other observatory directors, realised that he could hire women as a cheap and effective way to get this project done without affecting the main work of the observatory in measuring time by the stars. And so these so-called lady computers started in 1890 and Annie started a couple of months later in September 1891. Uh, we don't know the exact details of her training and observations, but at some point it seems that she was transferred across to the heliographic department where she became an expert in photographing and cataloguing sunspots. Um, and that's really become a key part of her story. Mm. Uh, now, you mentioned the role of lady computers there, and all of this was happen happening around the late 19th and early 20th centuries. What sort of struggles would Annie have faced as a woman in astronomy at that time, and how would that have affected her career journey? Yes, Annie really faced many struggles even before she started here at Greenwich. So one of the major hurdles was educational recognition for her achievements. So, for example, she studied at Girton College, Cambridge. She did exactly the same courses and exams as the male students, but she was not awarded a degree because that was not the, the case for women at that time. She also struggled to get any professional recognition. The main sort of organisation for professional astronomers back then and still today is the Royal Astronomical Society, but sadly women were not permitted to be members in the 1890s. So Annie and several of her colleagues here at Greenwich, both male and female, were actively involved in the formation of the British Astronomical Association, which was open to anyone with an interest in astronomy, male or female, amateur or professional, and that's still very active today. Mm. And then finally, there was also sort of social barriers in a sense that married women were not permitted to work in government organisations. So when Annie decided to marry Walter Maunder in December 1895, she had to give up her job here at the observatory. So it really just a whole series of barriers and challenges to getting involved in astronomy at that time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now, you mentioned Walter there. And in 1908, Annie and Walter published a book together. Uh, in fact, we do have it here, uh, The Heavens and Their Story, uh, which they published together, though in the preface, Walter does say that uh, this work is almost wholly the work of my wife. And this book contains many wonderful images that Annie took of the sun. What do you think was the intention behind this book and what do you think it meant to them to be able to publish this? Yes, this book is really a great example of Annie and Walter Maunder's passion and enthusiasm for astronomy. Um, as you say, Walter acknowledges his wife in the preface. Uh, they also say that this is not meant to be a textbook, it's not too serious or too heavy. It's very much about inspiring you to take an interest in astronomy and to learn more as you go along. And what I really like is that it's very accessible and they clearly say you don't need any fancy equipment, you just need your eyes and a sense of wonder to enjoy the subject. Now, as you can see, it's lavishly illustrated as well. It's got colour plates, it's got about 50 different illustrations, um, and it takes the reader on a journey, starting off with thinking about what you can see in the sky, so those basic motions of the stars, 
Then you go through the solar system, the sun, moon and planets, and then it goes out to think about Nebulae and the Milky Way. So it's a very comprehensive overview of the subject. Um, and what I really like is it's got a very personal touch uh, in a sense that the language is very much based on Annie Watermonder's very devout Christian beliefs. There are various references to the Bible and to the, the sense of wonder of God's creation. So it has a really nice touch. I like it. Yeah, fantastic. And you really can feel the passion sort of radiating off of the page as you read it. Uh, now, it is rather apt that we're going to be viewing a solar eclipse through a telescope that's named in Annie's honour. What role did eclipses play in Annie's life and work? Eclipses really were a major part of Annie's life and work after her marriage to Walter Maunder. So by now she was an amateur astronomer, very much involved with the British Association, or the BAA, as we call it. Call it. And uh, Annie Walter went on about five different eclipse expeditions, heading off to Norway, India, Algiers, Mauritius and Canada. And this provided Annie with an opportunity to use and sort of fine tune her photographic skills that she'd acquired here at Greenwich. Now, even just six months after her marriage, she acquired a grant to purchase a wide angle lens for a camera. And she intended to use this to photograph the Milky Way because you want to see a large part of the sky at once. But she realized that she could actually use this for eclipses as well. And she was absolutely right. Uh, on the 22nd of January, 1898, she took a photograph of the eclipse as seen from India. And the photograph really captures these huge coronal streamers, these jets of charged particles from the solar atmosphere. And um, it's said that when Annie displayed her photograph to the BAA, the whole audience erupted into applause because everyone recognised how difficult and how pioneering this photograph was. So uh, Annie continued to hone her skills using a whole combination of different telescopes and cameras and lenses, just like we do today. And she really cemented her reputation as a solar photographer. Fantastic. Uh, just to finish off, what would you say is Annie Maunder's legacy in astronomy? Well, on a simple level, we have her catalogue of sunspots, which I'm pleased to say she was actually allowed to publish in her own name in 1907, fully endorsed by the Astronomer Royal. So that meant other astronomers could use her data. Um, on a more subtle level, we know from her letters that she was actually involved with the creation of the very famous butterfly diagram. So this was published in around 1904, and you plot the position of the sunspots uh, on the solar disk according to their latitude. And over the course of the solar cycle, you can see how the sunspots appear at higher latitudes and then gradually lower and lower towards the equator, and you get this very distinctive butterfly pattern. Now this is a really iconic diagram within solar physics. It's still very relevant today. It's signed by Edward, Maunder, Edward Walter Maunder, but at least we know from the archives that Annie was very much involved in that. And we also know from some of her eclipse observations as well that she described effects that are now known and described by solar, solar physicists. So really great to have that legacy enduring, still sort of powering through us today. And I think just on a personal level, I just find her story so fascinating and it's really humbling when you think about all those challenges that she faced. And uh, that in itself, I think, is a challenge for us to make the most of the opportunities that we have. Fantastic. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And hopefully in some small way, the Annie Maunder Astrographic Telescope will help to carry on her legacy in some small way. Uh, but we do hope to capture something great through the telescope, but obviously probably nothing quite as amazing as what Annie captured in the past. Uh, Dr. Louise Devoy, thank you very much. Thank you, Jake. That was Dr. Louise Devoy, Senior Curator of the Royal Observatory, Greenwich. Now, let's take a look back at the Annie Maunder Astrographic Telescope because we are now approaching maximum. We're more than halfway approaching maximum. Maximum now in around 20 minutes time. What we're beginning to see now is even more of the moon as it passes over the surface of the sun. And again, one of the things that stands out is that rugged lunar terrain that we are seeing there. We're seeing the hills and valleys on the western limb of the moon, uh, or in fact not the western limb, we're looking more at the, the southern regions. But one of the, I mean there's lots of hills and valleys on the moon. The largest mountain on the moon is called Mons Huygens. It's about five kilometers high. So it really is not this very smooth marble. The moon is lumpy and bumpy. 
And again, as it moves across the sun, we are seeing this. Now, you might notice here on the feed, we're getting a bit of wibbly wobbly waviness. Now, that is no fault of the sun or the moon. That is, in fact, our atmosphere. Effectively, what we are looking through right now is about 100 kilometers of water molecules, or a lot of them. So it is like looking up into the sky through a swimming pool. So things do appear a little bit wibbly wobbly. But now we are getting that lovely uh, bite taken out of the sun. It is clear to see. And as we approach maximum, we are only going to see that more and more as we build towards about 16% coverage here in Greenwich. And depending on where you are across the UK, you may, might see as many as uh, or as much as 20, 22, 23% coverage. So it's going to be a fantastic view across the country today and across the world. Of course, if you are further east, you may get as high as 80% coverage. You will notice the sky getting darker. Now, just while we are viewing the eclipse here, we will answer a few questions that have come in. One of the questions is, how do all the planets and moons travel in such precise, predictable orbits? Well, there's a few different things to unpack there. Uh, firstly, not all of them are, well, not all of them are stable. That's worth saying. Some objects are on very unstable orbits, so the ones that are don't tend to hang around for very long. They usually crash into things or end up flying out of the solar system at a rate of knots. How are they so predictable? Well, we've got centuries worth of physics to thank for that. We've got Isaac Newton, we've got Albert Einstein, and just hundreds, if not thousands, of incredible uh, physicists that have helped us to predict these. Because yes, the moon's motion is entirely predictable. In fact, we know when solar eclipses are gonna happen for the next 100 years to incredible precision. So we know everything that's gonna happen in advance. I mean, not everything, but we know where those objects are gonna be in hundreds of years time. Another question come in, why don't solar eclipses happen every month at either new or full moon? Well, as we heard earlier, the moon's orbit is tilted at an angle of five degrees. So it does not always align with that invisible line connecting the sun and the earth. So we're not always gonna get eclipses every month. And as well, they're always gonna be at the new moon phase because that is when, uh, well, from our perspective, we can't see any of the far, of the near side of the moon because it will be in darkness, overwhelmed by the brightness of the sun. Though at full moon, we do get different types of eclipses. We do get lunar eclipses at full moon. That's when the moon enters into the shadow of the Earth. Instead, we end up getting what is commonly known as a blood moon. So that is a type of eclipse that does happen at full moon, but it is not solar. Now, the eclipse here is in full swing. The moon rocketing its way across the face of the sun, about three and a half thousand kilometers every hour. So it's moving about the length of its diameter every single hour. So it's an incredibly fast moving object. Even though when we look up in the sky, it looks rather static, it is moving contrary to, uh, well, other stars around it, if it is in the night sky, as the moon is moving anti-clockwise around the Earth. So in our skies, it is moving from west to east, while the sun and things like stars and other things like that. They're all moving uh, east to west relative to where we are. One more question here. Uh, would you be able to see a solar eclipse from the International Space Station and how would it look? The short answer is yes, that certainly is possible. As well as that, you can see a solar eclipse from a high altitude aircraft as well. The view is rather incredible. Uh, so you certainly can, just if you are orientated in the correct way. But there we are, the eclipse still ongoing. Fantastic view that we have through the Animonda Astrographic Telescope, because luckily the weather is still on our side at the moment, and we are very grateful for it. Now, the question might naturally arise to you, do we have eclipses on other planets? Is that possible? And the short answer is yes. In fact, you can get solar eclipses on other planets. You can get a solar eclipse on Mars, for example. And we have an image here. And in fact, the, as we can see there, just in the telescope feed, the clouds were starting to come over. So now is a good time to uh, talk a little bit about Mars instead. So this is Mars's largest moon, Phobos. As it eclipses the sun, it's not large enough in the sky for a total solar eclipse but just 
a partial one, or you may even call this annular of a sort. Phobos is only 22 kilometers across, so it is a very small object, but it is very close to Mars, only about 6,000 kilometers away, so it does appear rather large in the sky. As well as that, the Sun appears much smaller in the sky from Mars, only about two-thirds the size as we see it here from the Earth. So it's a smaller object to eclipse, and there is Phobos, one of the two moons of Mars, the other one being Deimos, only about 12 kilometers across. As you can see, Phobos is small, misshapen, looks like a potato. The reason for that is because it simply isn't massive enough to make itself nice and round under the force of its own gravity. But what about further out in the solar system? Can we get solar eclipses from Jupiter, for example? The answer is yes, we can. What we're seeing here is an image taken by NASA's Juno spacecraft. And what we're seeing is the shadow of Io, one of the Galilean moons, as it traverses across Jupiter. Now, Jupiter's a gas giant, which means it's got no solid surface for us to land on or stand on. So you can't really stand on the surface and view it. But if you were hovering above the clouds in a spaceship, you would be able to see that. And it would be rather easy to eclipse the sun from Jupiter since it's about five times smaller in the sky since Jupiter is about five times further away from the sun than we are here on the Earth. Now, uh, turning our attention back to the eclipse, you can see we're still making steady progress as we get now, now a very nice large bite out of the surface of the sun. Again, a little bit of wibbly wobbliness from the atmosphere, and as well as that, the rugged lunar terrain in action. We're seeing a few different valleys here as well. Now, those deep sections on the moon, those valleys, a lot of them are caused by collapsed lava tubes. You see, on the moon a few billion years ago, lava was flowing around all over the place, and over time, usually the top and the sides of the lava flow would solidify. And then, as the liquid lava underneath would flow all the way through, suddenly you're left with a hollow tube. And over time, those tubes collapse inwards, and what you're left with is a rather deep valley. So what we're seeing sort of here and here and here are basically those valleys, many of which will have been formed by those collapsed lava tubes across the lunar surface. Now, a lot of the fantastic imagery we've seen so far today have come courtesy of some incredibly advanced technology. But nowadays, what do modern solar researchers do? What tools do we use? to study the sun and what secrets still remain. Well, to find out more, I had a chat with Professor Lindsay Fletcher from the University of Glasgow to find out more. In times of old, the sun was an unknown, mysterious object that we knew very little about. Nowadays, we know a lot more about it thanks to centuries of fantastic research. But in 2022, what do modern solar researchers do and what mysteries about the sun still remain? Well, to answer that question and many more, I am delighted to be joined by Professor Lindsay Fletcher. Lindsay is a professor of astrophysics in the School of Physics and Astronomy at the University of Glasgow, as well as being an adjunct professor at the Rosalind Centre for Solar Physics at the University of Oslo. And she's a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. So, Lindsay, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you very much for inviting me, Jacob. Ah, our pleasure. Uh, now, the first question that I'm uh, really excited to ask you is about your research, because you've done a great deal of research on solar flares. So for those who don't know, what is a solar flare and what made you want to study them? OK, so a solar flare is kind of as simple as an explosion on the sun, uh, which means that it's unpredictable, it is very intense and it's actually quite short lived. And what we see is an enormous burst of radiation uh, coming from the surface and the atmosphere of the sun. And very often along with that is what's called a coronal mass ejection, which is uh, about a billion tonnes of gas, actually electrified gas called plasma, which is leaving the surface of the sun at about a million miles per hour roughly speaking. Now, I study the radiation part of this, the, the, the flare, the flash of in, uh, uh, intense burst of, of energy release. That's what I look at. 
Fantastic. And so what is your current research focused in on and what questions about the sun are you hoping to answer? Okay, so um, I'm concerned with the effects of a solar flare on a particular part of the solar atmosphere. This is a bit called the chromosphere. And if you like, if you think about layers in the atmosphere of the sun, like we have like layers in the atmosphere of the earth, um, the visible part that we see with our eyes is called the photosphere. That's where we see sunspots and so on. And the outer part is called the corona that's tenuous and hot. In between is a narrow, a narrow layer. When I say narrow, it's still about 2000 kilometers thick, but a narrow, highly structured, very complicated layer called the chromosphere. Chromos is, is uh, Greek for color, and it gets that name because when you see the chromosphere during a solar eclipse, it's got a beautiful dark pink red kind of color. Now, um, flares have very dramatic effects in the corona. I mean, I'm sure that people watching this will, or they may have, or they should, go and look at movies from the Solar Dynamics Observatory of Flares when you see all kinds of magic happening in the corona. But in fact, most of the radiation that's emitted and most of the radiation that we understand the flare from is emitted in the chromosphere. And so I'm looking at that thin part of the solar atmosphere and I'm using a technique called spectroscopy where we, we split the light up using a, well, not, it's not a prism anymore, it's a thing called a diffraction grating, into its component wavelengths and look at the spectral lines, the emission lines and absorption lines which are formed and try and work out what's happening in that layer. How fast is it moving? How dense is it? How hot is it? How quickly does it get heated? How turbulent is it? So all of the details of the chromosphere, which will tell us about how energy arrives in the chromosphere and how it's dissipated and what, what it does when, it's get, when it gets there. Fantastic. It sounds very complex and like it might rely on some very advanced modern technology to help assist you in that research. What kind of tools do you use to help you research the sun? So at the moment, I am using um, data from a spacecraft called the IRIS spacecraft that stands for Interface Region Imaging Spectrograph, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, I probably got that wrong and the PI will kill me for getting it wrong, but the IRIS spacecraft. And now th this is a, it's above the Earth's atmosphere. And the reason it has to be above the Earth's atmosphere is because the radiation I'm looking at is ultraviolet radiation. And uh, that's a part of the wavelength, the, the electromagnetic spectrum, which is absorbed by the Earth's atmosphere. You can't see it from the ground. You know, it, it's the bad radiation. That's the stuff that burns you and gives you all kinds of nasty diseases. Um, so I look at data from the spacecraft, which is above the atmosphere, and I'm looking at the ultraviolet part of the spectrum. So this is a, a, a spacecraft which um, orbits around the Earth and it does takes, takes images, takes pictures, but it also um, takes spectra. Um, so that's what I'm using right now, mostly, along with some other imaging uh, spacecraft like the Solar Dynamics Observatory in space. But I am very much hoping very soon to get some data from a new ground-based telescope, which, telescope, which is called the um, Daniel K. Inouye Solar Telescope, or DECAST. And it is a, when I say it's a four-meter telescope, that means its main mirror is four meters across, which is small by astronomical telescope standards, you know, where if you think about like the extremely large telescope, it's going to be like 30 mm -hmm. meters or something, I can't remember. Yeah. Um, uh but for solar, the solar case, it's big, you know, the sun's very bright, so you can do a lot with a four beta mirror. And that just started taking science observations, you know, within about the last um, year or so, and uh, we're hoping to get some data from that very soon. So again, I'll be looking at images and spectra, but now in a part of the spectrum, the visible part, which our eyes can detect. And so you can, you can do it from the ground. Fantastic. Uh, and a lot of it sounds like the stuff of science fiction. It's so incredibly advanced uh, and exciting, but I mean, in the past, say 100 years ago, of course, we didn't have anything quite like that. And solar astronomers like Annie Maunder, for example, would rely on things like solar eclipses to study the lesser seen parts of the sun. But how does that work? How can a solar eclipse be used to study the sun? Oh, it can, it's still very important. Um, astronomers, the solar astronomers still get really excited when an eclipse is happening. And that is because of the 
amazing coincidence of the disk of the sun having exactly the same apparent size as the disk of the moon. And every so often they co-align. Um, and that means that we can see, uh, we block out the radiation from the bright disk of the sun and we can see the very tenuous corona. And also we can see this part I mentioned, the chromosphere, we can see filaments and we can see prominences and all kinds of lumps and bumps in the chromosphere. Um, now, we do have in space, we have got, and also on the ground, instruments called coronagraphs, which are kind of like fake eclipses, which are there all the time. But they, just because of the way the optics works and the problem of what's called diffraction, which is the bending of light around the edge of uh, an object, um, you cannot look so close in. You're, you can't go into like one solar diameter. You can't see just, just at that, that edge. It's more like two or 1.1 or something like that so with an eclipse um if you like the 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 disc that the light is having to bend around is very much farther away it's the moon and so that effect of diffraction is not so important and uh, so we can see really close in uh to to the surface of the of the sun and the inner corona and just um make amazing uh observations of the complexity in the inner corona and you just we just don't with again with very high resolution from the ground with instruments that we can control very well and we still do a lot of valuable science with eclipses even though they're only very short um even though they're only you know about seven minutes maximum i forget the exact number uh there's just bits of the solar atmosphere that you cannot reach any other way Fantastic. So eclipses still can be useful for researchers today. Yes, they can. They can. Um, and there's other things that people do. Like, for example, um, there are eclipse chasers in planes that try and you know, track the path of totality for a, as long as possible so that they can get that view of the inner corona for as long as possible. Um, and also you can do things like um, capture the what we call the dynamics, the movements in the inner corona at very, very high time cadence, very, very high um, uh, frames per second, if you like. And uh, that's done also in eclipses. People, you know, go chasing them with their scientific instruments. Again, to look at this, the detail of the inner atmosphere that you can't get elsewhere. And, you know, why is the inner atmosphere important? It's or the inner corona important. It's because we think this is um, one of the places that the acceleration of the solar wind starts, that the, um, uh, the, the processes that heat the solar corona originate in this location. So there's, there are scientific questions that we can answer by looking at this inner part as well. But, um, you know, I suppose the other valuable thing is just when a solar eclipse happens, Everybody knows about it and everybody knows about the sun and solar physicists get so excited just about this phenomenon that they're able to see. Um, so it's got that, that other value. Um, it's a really good way to help educate people about the sun and about what's going on in the sun. Oh, fantastic. A free piece of marketing. It is a free piece of marketing. Yes. Indeed. Yeah. Except they often have to fly to, you know, places like Svalbard to see it. You know, so in that <laughs> sense, I don't really see it. Yes. Uh, well, from our end here at the Royal Observatory, I mean, we'll feel lucky just if we're able to see the partial solar eclipse uh, and hopefully the clouds uh, stay away. Oh, uh, <laughs> uh, but for now, I'll say, well, Professor Lindsay Fletcher, thank you so much for joining us. You're very welcome. And I, uh, fingers crossed, fingers crossed for your eclipse as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. There we go, that's better. Well, fingers crossed seems to have done the trick because we do have clear skies here in Greenwich. So let's take a look at our feed through the Animonda Astrographic Telescope. Uh, here we are, so we are now approaching maximum. We're only about five minutes away at this point. So we are getting close to that full 16%. Now, one of the things, in fact, that makes an eclipse here on the Earth so special, because of course we do get eclipses on other planets, but the thing that makes Earth so special is there is a beautiful cosmic coincidence and relationship between the moon and the sun. And that is that the moon is 400 times smaller than the sun in terms of its diameter, 
but also by total chance, it is 400 times closer to us, which does often make the two appear almost perfectly the same size in the sky that leads to perfect coverage during total solar eclipses. And as far as we are aware, we are the only planet in the solar system to get perfect solar eclipses like that, where you get full 100% coverage, because out in the solar system, where things are, and in fact, we've just seen the clouds go over now. So in fact, we're gonna switch to our feed from across the globe, courtesy of our friends over at timeanddate.com. Uh, and in fact, so we're seeing the eclipse from Norway here, their maximum a little bit higher than ours. They're getting a maximum of about almost 40%, which they are closely approaching as are we. Fantastic view from Norway. Uh, here's our view back in Greenwich. We've got the sun back once again. The clouds have parted. But yes, this beautiful cosmic coincidence where, in fact, as far as we are aware, we are the only planet in the solar system to get perfectly sized solar eclipses. Far out in the solar system, the sun is much smaller. The moons of the outer solar system can eclipse the sun, but they're much bigger than the sun. They're not the same size. So you don't get those perfectly sized eclipses like we do here. But there we are, slowly approaching maximum now. And in fact, the rugged lunar topography that we are seeing in action, these beautiful little lumps and bumps showing us the hills and valleys of the moon really are special. And in fact, they really uh, come into their own stardom during total solar eclipses. We'll very quickly show you an image from a total solar eclipse taken in 2017. This was seen over uh, parts of North America. And in fact, you're seeing just a few minutes before totality and down at the bottom left of the eclipse at the seven o'clock position, you are seeing what is known as Bailey's beads. So these are the last few beads of sunlight shining through some of the deepest valleys on the moon. And they're known as Bailey's beads since they were first explained by the astronomer Francis Bailey. Now on this particular eclipse, as you move a few minutes closer to totality, you get another image of another phenomenon caused by that rugged lunar topography that we can show you now, where we see just one bead of light remaining through the deepest lunar valley on that limb of the moon. And then we end up getting what's known as the diamond ring effect. So we are seeing the deepest valley, that last bead of light shining through, and you get what looks like a rather large diamond on a beautiful ring, as we see there, around the outside of the moon. And then a few moments after that, we get totality of a total solar eclipse. And then the lunar topography sort of leaves our mind behind and our eyes are instantly drawn to the solar corona, the thin, wispy outer atmosphere of the sun that we heard about earlier. Now that stretches millions of kilometers out from the sun's surface and in places is over one million degrees Celsius. That's hotter than the surface of the sun which is a balmy five and a half thousand degrees on the outer surface. The reason for that is still not fully understood, uh, but that is part of the work of the Parker Solar Probe that is currently whizzing its way around the sun as we speak. So we've got a fantastic view still. We are steadily, in fact, we are bang on maximum right now. This is 16% coverage from here in London. Across the globe where you are, uh, those times are going to differ. Across the UK, they're only going to differ by a few minutes. So depending on where you are in the UK, you may have had maximum a couple of minutes ago, or you're going to have it in a couple of minutes' time. But this is it. We are seeing the clockwork of the solar system in action. We were able to accurately predict when these events were going to happen many, many years ago, and we will continue to do that into the future. But this is it. We are seeing our very own natural satellite, the moon, as it passes over the sun, blocking 16% of its light from our perspective. This is incredible. And again, we're seeing those subtle little shapes on the moon as well that ordinarily we're just not able to see if we look up into the moon or look up into the sky to take a look at the moon. So this is really rather incredible. We are bang on maximum eclipse. And remember, if you want to view this for yourself at home, you're going to need solar eclipse glasses or specially uh, specialized solar equipment, things like solar telescopes, solar binoculars, things like that. If you want to project the eclipse safely onto the ground, you can use a pinhole projector. 
And remember, do not look at the sun through sunglasses. That is not sufficient to block out enough of the sun's light. You're going to need solar eclipse glasses. Sunglasses tend to block out only 20% of the sun's visible light. So that is just not good enough. And it looks like the clouds have descended. Oh, just a patch. Just a patch. So, in fact, it's gone. And it's gone. But that's okay, because, well, we've got other things to discuss, and we will come back to this view in just a little while. But here at the Royal Observatory, we absolutely love astrophotography, as you might be able to tell some of the fantastic images we've been looking at today. We love astrophotography so much, in fact, that every year we run the Astronomy Photographer of the Year competition, where the best astrophotographers from around the world submit their entries into the competition. Now, one of the categories of that competition is the Annie Maunder Prize for Image Innovation, where entrants are challenged to take publicly available data and transform it into something new and captivating. So, what goes into a winning image for a category like that? Well, let's take a look and see. My artwork is a relationship between sky, time, place and astronomy. I'm particularly interested into our relationship to our ancestors and how they would have perceived the night sky. Trees are a map to our past and there's been scientific research in tree rings and how they can show an element called carbon-14. And so I was interested in this in terms of that link between us being made of carbon and also the time element of tree rings. I kind of started looking at solar data online and was just like, gosh, there's all this information that you can pull down and start creating things with. And I just thought, well, we're at the beginning of solar cycle 25. What would it look like if I took an image from the first of the month until, I don't know, February of 2021? and laid them, how would that look? And it started to look like the rings of a tree. I wanted to be a scientist when I was a, a youngster and I didn't follow that pathway. So being shortlisted and then winning the category is an amazing achievement for me and hopefully inspiring other women and other girls to look up at the night sky. And if you've got that creative flair, go with it. Um, it's a really important journey and it's one that's really, really worth taking. The solar tree, what a beautiful image and a well-deserved winner. Now, if you're interested in taking a closer look at that image and all of the other wonderful short limit, uh, shortlisted images from the competition, then the Astronomy Photographer of the Year exhibition is currently ongoing at the National Maritime Museum here in Greenwich. As well as that, you can buy the book so you can have all of those fantastic images to take home with you as well. Now, we are just a few minutes past maximum now, and as we turn our attention to the Annie Maunder Astrographic Telescope feed, we can see that the clouds have finally descended. They are beginning to clear from time to time, but it looks like it's getting a little bit thicker, the clouds here in Greenwich. But luckily, we did have a fantastic view on maximum. Let's take a look at the feed from across the globe, courtesy of our friends at timeanddate.com. So here we are looking at Siena in Italy. Now, their view of the eclipse is looking rather splendid, isn't it? They've got rather clear skies where they are. We are very jealous indeed. But they've got a fantastic view there. And they are approaching maximum. In fact, pretty much bang on there. Just a little bit more than us here in Greenwich. And what a fantastic view. Here we've got our feed once again. The clouds have parted. But they are trying their best to hang around. They clearly like us but uh, we don't like them, so clouds, it'd be best if you went away. But there we are, Siena in Italy, beautiful, beautiful clear skies and a fantastic eclipse. Look at that beautiful bite taken out of the sun. It looks like Pac-Man yawning. What a beautiful sight to see. Absolutely fantastic. Well, we have just passed over maximum here in Greenwich, 
So in fact, what we are going to do in just a few moments' time is we are going to switch over to a quiet stream, which means you will be able to continue to enjoy the view of the eclipse, but we're not going to have any more live commentary or coverage. So before we go, I'd like to say a huge thank you to our collaborators today, Professor Lindsay Fletcher, Dr. Louise DeVoy, Anna Gammon-Ross, and our friends over at timeanddate.com as well. A huge thank you to Dr. Greg Brown, who has been diligently operating the telescope all morning long, and to our team here at the Royal Museum's Greenwich, who have been helping to make all of this happen. And finally, a huge thank to a huge thank you to all of you at home for watching. Uh, I've been Jake Foster. That's all from me. And we hope you very much enjoy the view. And wherever you're viewing from today, we wish you all clear skies. Thank you very much. Goodbye.